The following podcast contains strong language, like what the actual fuck. Scarecrow Festival is like the most important day of the year. Daft cow. This is just ridiculous. What the actual fuck. Hey, what the actual fuckers, and welcome to WTAF of This Country podcast. Now, first, he's the man that's just gone through my entire pre-Christmas tub of celebrations and scoffed the bounties as he loves an underdog. It's Neil. Hello, Pav. Hello, hello, hello. I do love a bounty, actually. Who doesn't? I don't understand I why people are so bad on bounties. Oh, I love bounties. And especially the dark chocolate bounty. Ooh, that's no. a sensation, that one. Now you're going a bit too far now. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's, for for a man like me uh, who loves his chocolate, there's <laughs> nothing better than getting a bounty trio where you get an extra bounty. Oh, and, yeah, that's a, that's a, mean, like a, a gift that keeps on giving. Indeed one. it is. Now, our super fan guest this episode is an award-winning writer of such things as Dublin Murders, The ABC Murders, adapted J.K. Rowling's novel The Casual Vacancy for TV, and wrote nearly 100 episodes of EastEnders. Will you please welcome Sarah Phelps? Hey, <laughs> hi, guys. Hi, guys. Finally, hey. we finally got you here. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm just horrified by your dark chocolate bounty thing. Milk chocolate, yep, I'm all over that. I am all over that. Dark chocolate, you're just trying to be fancy. <laughs> if you want to go bounty, you're embracing the trash. If you're going oh. dark chocolate, I, I don't even, I, I can barely look at you. I don't I don't normally like dark chocolate, but I think it complements the ch- the coconut really well. Oh, do you? Do you uh, indeed? <laughs> There's nothing like alienating our guest, Neil, right at the very start <laughs> of the uh, start will, of the episode. I will send you some now, sir. <laughs> right. Look, where do you stand on a crunchy? That's all I need to know. Oh, crunchy is heaven. Oh. Okay, so the big question is, do you just eat a crunchy normally or do you like nibble the chocolate off and just leave the honeycomb? Well, I like to dip my crunchy in a frothy coffee. Oh. And also, oh, look, you're going to get this for free, but it will live in your head, which is you take a twirl, right, and you bite the ends off and then you get your frothy coffee and you suck. So your first sip of your frothy coffee is through the twirl straw. It doesn't last long after that. You've got to push that bad boy down because it's melted. <laughs> but it's a to- it's it's a good experience. Right, so can- crunchy hangs on to its shape a little bit better. Can I also give a shout out to the double decker? A very good chocolate bar. Oh, indeed, indeed. But can you do the same thing? Because I don't like coffee. So can you do the same thing with a hot chocolate then? Or is that too much you, chocolate? Well, yeah, but then you're just going to get double chocolate. You're a man that loves chocolate. You're going to get the full. Of- but what I'm saying to you is, is it's a froth. You want the hot froth. It, you don't want the boiling liquid. Right. That thing's going to just melt all over your face. It's going to be like Anton Deck eating eyes in I'm a Celebrity. Horrible, <laughs> horrible. Brown stuff dripping off their chin. <laughs> Disgusting. You want to go for the froth. I, I promise you, you won't look back. Right. That's on my to-do list now. That is, is it wrong that all I want to do is have a crunchy now? I just want to go and have a crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a half an hour just delving into our uh, favorite. Stuff. Yes. Welcome to the chocolate podcast. <laughs> Normally I don't even like chocolate, but if it's kind of mixed with something bitter, chocolate with salt in it, oh my God. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can go along with that. I can go along with Chocolate with salt. Yeah. Anything that's really sweet and claggy, I can't bear, but chocolate with salt or chocolate with bitter coffee, man, I'm all over that. I love it. Right. We know what to get right. you for Christmas now then, Sarah. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was canny here. I was literally laying, you know, I was laying a path to my door of what I, what I want. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, right. Well, we're here to, here to talk about this country to start with. Um, yes. And the question I like to ask a lot of our superfan guests is, where did it, come on your radar first when did you first find out about the show i think it came on my radar first when they very first started showing it and one of the things uh, i didn't know anything about daisy may and charlie cooper at all but a friend of mine um paul shahidi was uh it plays fiery francis indeed and so obviously if he's in something he's most he's such a brilliant actor i'm, I'm obviously gonna take it for a while and weirdly the world that um this country inhabits was a world that I'd been writing about with 
the casual vacancy, which is all these beautiful, beautiful Cotswold villages, which are sort of second homes and for commuter belts and, you know, their their little tiny enchanting little roads are absolutely rammed with giant SUVs. And for people that are sort of have lived there all their lives, there's absolutely fuck all there <laughs> for them. And you know, if you want to get somewhere then into town, then you have to be able to drive or you have to wait a long time for a bus. And it's it, it feels like there's very much like two completely distinct worlds in those little villages. And when we were filming there in um oh for fuck's sake, sorry about that everybody. <laughs> so okay. when we when we when we were filming there to do the casual vacancy, you were so aware that when everybody went to work, it was kind of deserted. And when everybody crammed back, that suddenly it was just humming with sort of barbecues and SUVs. And you thought, well, where do the people live who always lived here? And then you'd sort of go out to these estates. And it 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 was a, a really strange experience. And that mm -hmm. formed the kind of backbone of a, the casual vacancy. And so there was already an interest there for the world that um, Daisy May and Charlie were writing about beyond mm. just wanting to watch my friend be hilarious yeah <laughs> so did you do you have a favorite series in particular Sarah? well i was thinking about this because i I'd, I'd kind of um i got completely invested in a certain story and the certain story was how much carrie idolized her dad and how much he ruined her life mm. and i was thinking about um you know coming on here and talking about the show and i was just flipping back through some of my favorite episodes and really and thinking about that one of my favorite episodes is threatening letters mm. because it has everything it has big mandy stalking hannah spirit from s club seven it has curtain doing a day's laboring for martin and dan and with some of the most exquisite physical comedy i think anybody's ever seen mm. it has some really actually brutal stuff about trying to get a parent's attention it has a terrible feeling of shame because you know curtain sort of slapping um uh Suggs's drink out of his hand it, and you just you know how and how much everybody gets drawn into martin mucklow's horrible sort of like toxic gravitational field mm. but we'll talk more in depth about it later but by the time you've come to the end of it and you've come through all the threatening letters and big mandy and her nunchucks you realise something else is that Curtin realises who Martin Mucko is. And it feel, he, he knows that actually he is a really bad human being. Because mm. he's been kind of um, joining in with this hero worship of him. Oh, yeah, of course you did. You went to the Carberry and your sister-in-law and your mother-in-law both wanted to go on your old chat. And then your <laughs> wife asked you out, but she was her turn on the big dip. And on and on and on. And then he calls him a sort of like big bull fanny or something. I mean, it's by the end of that episode, Curtin's called him out. Curtin's seen him for what he is. And that really lays the groundwork for the rest of that series too. And then going into that absolutely heartbreaking series three where there is that real conflict where just Carrie just can't see it. Mm. She cannot see who her dad is. She loves him so much and just wants the pat on the head. And Curtin's already gone, no, he's a wanker. He's mm. an absolute fucking arsehole. He's cruel. He's, he's a liar. He's manipulative. He doesn't love you. And it's one of those, it felt to me like, beyond the fact that it's hilarious, beyond the fact that, you know, the threatening letters, and it's actually like, you, you, you didn't have, um, you just punched me in the, you punched me in the genitals and then you laughed at them. It just, all of that genius, there is, incredible narrative structure going on underneath it all and when i was sort of revisiting the episodes i thought the writing and the performing in this is so good tiny tiny little details mm. that you know um sort of jumping around the episode a little bit but i don't think it matters yeah. um which is when you know martin mucklow pulls up in his car and says curtain are you working and Kerry, Kerry's like, I, I haven't got any work, I haven't got any work. And he just ignores her, ignores her, ignores her, ignores her, talking to Kurt and talking to her. And even as she's saying, I haven't, I haven't got any work, and the van drives off, she switches it to, yeah, see ya, see ya. All happy, all jovial, like she's part of that crew, sort of smacking the van on the side, like, like you do when a mate goes mm -hmm. off. <clears throat> and I just keep thinking, the, 
the writing and the performance, but also the the way that the story is structured. So they know where they're going with this. They know where they're going with this story, and there's such confidence about telling, I suppose, the intricacies of a really, really sad story and not being frightened for it to be sad. You're laughing, but also you, you know, when by the time that story drops and poor Carrie realizes that her dad would literally, he'd, he, he'd walk over her bones for a quid. It's just heartbreaking. And I, I love the confidence with which those guys write and perform that story mm -hmm. that they're not scared to go somewhere actually which is going to be you know very 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 heartbreaking mm. yeah. so, as a writer yourself when you're watching something like this is it hard to put the writer side of you away to enjoy enjoy something or do you just naturally are you naturally analytical about it and breaking it down no i think in the first instance when you're watching it you're just reveling in the fun of it but there isn't anything you're always aware that of all the nuances of um those performances because it's it does that thing which the very best comedy does which is you are crying with laughter and then you you've got that intake of breath which is oh god the mm. the um the speed of that pivot the speed of it and then the speed back away from it as well mm. is just stunning so you know that you know i'm, I'm enjoying it as a as a as a punter because i hate watching if i'm watching shows with a kind of analytical head on that show isn't working you, you know once you've seen about you know and i've watched you know i watched the series when it went out and then when um lockdown kind of came and hit us and in their infinite wisdom the bbc thought what everybody really needs is all three series of this of this country and i play yes we do thank you <laughs> and so i kind of watched and, and i sort of watched it again for the pleasure of it and so i revisited um some of the episodes recently for this podcast and then i was kind of like watching it with a sort of view of wanting to talk about the kind of work and the craft that goes into it because they make it look like breathing they mm. make it look like breathing and and it's sort of dizzying really because you know that there's so much work and craft gone into every single moment every single tiny look every little look to camera every look between Kerry and curtain every sort of moment where big mandy is sort of like facing the camera and doing the slow, slowest nunchuck thing going in the world and you're just wincing with the sheer pain of it mm. you know the work that's gone into it and i think you can really enjoy it as a punter but i think you know the biggest compliment is to go look i'm still enjoying it as a punter but there's that part of my brain that just goes this is really extraordinary astonishing work and they make it they do it so deftly so mm. deftly with such a sort of light acrobatic touch but my god it lands its punches when it mm -hmm. wants to land a punch you reel from that punch you really feel it so which characters are, are the ones that, apart from Kerry and Curtin then are really highlighted to you well I think one of the things I mean the thing I've always got I come from a very small town and um, it's not like really rural. It was just on the sort of outskirts of London, but it was that sort of thing where if you went to London on the train, you know, you were a wanky, you think you're too good for us. So there was that real sort of insular, inward looking kind of, if you want to go and look at something else then you're not, you can't be part of us. Why isn't this little town good enough for you? Et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I kind of recognize, um, the atmosphere and the kind of the vibe of that tiny little town which is everybody knows you everybody knows what you're doing and it's almost like there's no escape and you're always performing some kind of role like let's all laugh at martin's jokes pint for pint with martin mucklow this means i sort of stepped up and you always were aware that there would always be these guys these middle-aged guys who had a tiny amount of power and wielded it like some medieval fucking tyrant <laughs> mm. Ty no power and just like bullshit about getting wanked off in a carvery oh fuck off mate the only person who's touched that recently is you when you took it out to look at your warts and it's, <laughs> but 
everybody <laughs> buys into that mythology you know like they're the, they're the local king and you've got to go along with it and if you confront them you don't know how that's going to upset the order of of your kind of little world so i really like and you're really aware that martin is completely like shit dad he's shit dad you know he's shit dad yeah. but i'm really interested in how that that plays out like if because he's the local king and Kerry especially is a sort of she always feels like this just bowling around waiting for someone to take her under their wing which is why mm -hmm. Fari Francis is so important so when I think about all the characters that stand out it's like the kind of the goodness of Fari Francis even though he is tested beyond endurance mm. and also and I absolutely love him and again it's not because Paul plays him so well it's because he embodies something which is so rare and it is how difficult it is to be good how did you know like whether it's a comedy situation or a dramatic situation that like everybody says that goodness what writes white it's a blank page and so but this doesn't it's like he's always smiling he's always trying to do the right thing he's always trying to guide carry and curtain and every now and again he kind of like reaches the end of his tether but you know that he will right redress the balance and be good again and i absolutely love i love big mandy she terrifies me i love her i love her book of tattoos i love her tattoos in the neck I love it when she kind of like follows them, sort of talking about stuff. And you can see them just edging away. They're absolutely terrified of her. She's got one of those teardrop tattoos at the corners of her eye. You sort of think, God, I used to, pe people like that used to go in the pub I used to go in. <laughs> just like you know her. Yeah. But and one of the, one of the, and I, I love Carrie's mum, always off screen. Mm. Can I come in, Mum? Yeah, you can, but I ain't got a stitch on. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing in there? And always sort of screaming down. But one of the things I loved about like threatening letters was that you got to see um Suggs, you know, Michael Suggs, and it just uh, just hit you all over again. What a, mm. what a sad, sad, sad thing that was. It was yeah. but um so that episode for me, that was one of the ones I picked out for for hilarity for heartbreak and for really setting up the most quietly and but with great dexterity the most incredible kind of dramatic springboard for subsequent series and for how Kerry and Curtin's relationship and how Vicar Francis and how everything would then feed into how Martin Mucklow absolutely fucks Kerry over. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what you say as well because in that episode and I think it's the only episode in all of this country that Ker uh, Curtin actually calls Martin out when he gets sacked and says, oh yeah, you know, all, all the gear, no idea. And yeah. Martin, Martin genuinely looks like he's about to cry because, you know, and Dan has to put his hand around his shoulder like, oh, you know, poor Martin. Somebody actually calls him out to his face. Yeah. And he doesn't like it. He's going to cry because he's not the big man anymore. And it's interesting you saying that because he does play the king like the leader like the, it's all it's all his land even so much to the point when you see in um curtain's half brother when you see the video that he's holding court because he's got like a ringtone on his phone and he's like the dj of the party and he's the he has to be the lord of the manor so it's interesting what you say about that it, he is he's got to be the strutting cock and you just think you are just a horrible bully who's never done anything good or meaningful in your life and i yeah. always think that I, I i love the way that you have the kind of because even mum you know she never, you never see her but she's still there shouting at carrie to get her something or to flush the toilet or <laughs> do whatever yeah but i love the way that the uselessness of martin mucklow is placed against the absolute usefulness of fiery francis and his and his good deeds and his well-meaningness and his actually doing something you know, it's always, yeah, I find it actually really moving. And it's also because you know he's horrible and he's got this Dan to sort of like bully everyone for him. You know, yeah. he doesn't have to do a thing. He just has to look kind of away. It's just like, no, you don't make jokes about Swindon Town. Mm. You don't do that. And mm. you just, you know, the kind of, it's, it's that tiny little town mentality. And it sort of makes me think of all the kind of factions, you know, we've, where the way we live at the moment is that you 
we're in the middle of a pandemic, but so, somehow all the news is about factions within 10 Downing Street. And you kind of look at Martin and Dan and go, oh, you're just those horrible little bully boys that everybody mythologizes. And then when everyone stops mythologizing you and the power goes, you're absolutely nothing. You're just a fat bloke. You're just mm. a miserable bloke. You're a bloke with a rich, that's got nothing but a dirty, dirty man and a load of broken promises and no one to really love you. And so that kind of, uh, yeah, that's why I like it. Mm. Yeah. So as a writer yourself then, Sarah, is a character like Martin, do you find them easier to write than, let's just say, a generic everyday? No, I don't think so, because there's got to be a real kind of, but that's what I mean about like really admiring the writing of this country mm -hmm. and the performing of this country, because if somebody is an arsehole straight away, then they're just then then they just want no. And the thing is about Martin is one that you always think there's a potential there for him to sort of do the right thing. He probably isn't going to do the right thing. He's going to do the wrong thing. But you always think there's a potential there for him not to be an arsehole. And so you have to kind of layer that. But you, it, if you make it so obvious that he's just an absolute flat out wanker then you run the risk of Kerry looking like a simpleton now Kerry bless her there she you know there isn't that many original thoughts but you need to understand why she's so from a dramatic point of view you, and a comedic point of view you need to understand why she is so desperate for her dad's love and mm. if he just looks like somebody who all the time is just an arsehole then you make her look stupid and there and 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 it diminishes her heartbreak mm. so one of the really clever things about what, what this country does is by the time you've got um kind of martin going can you do this for me kerry you kind of think oh okay it looks dodgy but could it be genuine so when he does completely betray her you have to feel that shock mm. otherwise her going through this you it is kind of meaningless you're just standing outside of it and looking in you have to know what it means what it means to her everyone can say to you he's going to let her down he's going to let her down mm -hmm. but the power of daisy may's performance and the power of the writing and the power of all those actors around her means that when he betrays it it absolutely knocks the breath out of you and mm -hmm. that's one of the that's that's the power of this I don't know, this little show set in this little village that it managed to do these great big kind of Shakespearean scenes all in a crappy locked up garage with some dishwashers or whatever the hell it is. I, I, I can't remember now. Mm. Hoover's, isn't it? It's Hoover's, it, Dyson's. Yeah, yeah, Dyson's. Yeah, 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 Dodgy yeah. Dyson's. Yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, that's one of the things why I love it so much, which is it's so complex but it wears that complexity so incredibly lightly. And it's sort of, um, it's really stealthy like that. You think you're watching two, two idiots bumbling around a village in, 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 you know, snide hoodies, and you're not, you're watching something incredibly potent and incredibly nuanced and incredibly sad and funny and sweet and heartbreaking, but, you know, it is that it is incredibly stealthy with the way it tells its stories and the way it builds its relationships. Mm. That's why I, that's that's why I love it. So when you the have best, a the best the best comedy is dramatic and the best drama has comedic uh, has mm. comedic elements. I yeah, think. that actually that was the point I was going to ask you about is that especially the scene in Family Laws is when they're in Martin's van and Martin is saying to her, "You need to go to the police." You know prison isn't going to be that bad and um and you know he, he killed a dog and all of this sort of stuff oh. when, when you've got that scene where one minute you're yeah one minute you're laughing what? and then the next minute you're crying because you have that in the same scene does it amplify both emotions do you think mm. yeah without a doubt i mean if it was just so kind of it, you've got to kind of dance from one thing to another and again, that comes down to that, and that really offhand way the, the, the actors do it, like I say, it looks like breathing. Yeah. It looks so naturalistic. It looks like they, it looks like you have snuck up on them with a camera. And 
so the craft that's gone into that from being able to jump you've got to go to the police well i killed this dog i've forgotten about that so much i should have watched that one as well before coming on because <laughs> i can remember actually watching it the first time around and sort of gasping and inhaling a load of gin and <laughs> coughing my guts up <laughs> but he just go this is pure mucklow this is pure yeah. modern mucklow which is just the absolute unalloyed savagery for him to get what he wants mm. and then you just look at Kerry and think you have absolutely no weapons you are an unshelled baby bird waiting for someone to love you and take care mm. of you and you've chosen this man and he ain't gonna do it and it just and and so yeah you're not just yes you're watching a comedy which is brilliant and it's so funny but it just goes deeper than that just deep 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 that, that deep tap mm. through into someone loved me someone take care of me how do i live how do i bumble through my day with my mum upstairs without a stitch on and all i've got is mr kipling cakes and i'm re recording her poll dark and someone's yeah. sending me sexy letters yeah. and it, you know i love it because of that yeah and the, the button on that scene is again then is he's gone through all of it she finally says okay then take me to the police station well it's not really on my way care he can't even, I know, I know. Can't even do that for her so again you don't i i remember watching that the first time and not knowing whether to laugh or whether to oh, throw that yeah because it was it was so dark and so cutting that you think well, no, it's also that just done it for you like, Oh, you cut yourself, have you? Well, just pass us your arm because I've got some salt here. Yeah. Anyway, get out and walk. Take yourself there because uh, I've got to go to the carvery and get tugged off by my mother-in-law. <laughs> it's, 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 you just go, oh. And yet, you know, the thing is, is that I fucking know people like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know people like that. You know, yeah. the small town king who absolutely does not give a flying fucker a rolling donut for anyone but his own status and mm. how much admiration he gets when he brings out his tawdry anecdotes in the pub. I used to be mm. a barmaid. Oh, the bullshit you hear. Oh, yeah. I can't, yeah. I can't even describe it. Like some old bloke with a toupee telling you about his sexual conquest. Yeah, are you really? Really? Mm. Really? I wouldn't. I wouldn't touch you with hers my god <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 always becomes a mythology and that's why i kind of love curtain when he goes no you're nothing you might yeah. have a, you know you're actually you're nothing yeah and you and you love him for it you just think but even then he still believes that you know that yeah. that scene in the carvery happened that's disgusting you can't mm. you know he believes that happened anyway yeah would you like to have seen Martin get his sort of a little bit more comeuppance at all? You know, like Kerry telling him maybe to fuck off. Well, I don't know. That might have felt too neat because what generally happens is that nothing much very really happens mm. and people just carry on. But here's the thing. They get older and they die and or they get older and they become iller and less and less people believe their lies and their influence gets less and less and people turn more to fiery francis than they do to martin mucklow and the arc of the universe bends towards justice so it's not so much as a kind of legal comeuppance it's just a switching of loyalties and affections and worldviews a slow slow transition from thinking your dad is the best thing in the world and being desperate for his approval and his adulation and looking instead for somebody who's always been there and who is kind and can guide you and give you that protection and that, mm. that love that you've been craving all your life and craving from someone who is just not in him to give it to you. Mm. Just not in him. No. I've always found it interesting that we've never seen the vicar and Martin Mucklow in the same scene. They've never I shared. Think maybe the world. I think maybe the world. I think Francis might take a cricket bat to, to uh, Martin's head. <laughs> Mart <laughs> Martin would be like, oh, right, come on, come on, who wants it? Who wants it? And then Fiery Francis would just see red. Yeah. He'd just see red, and all of his nice sort of Church of England morals and ethics would fall away. And he'd take that cricket bat and he'd smack him upside the head. Martin Mucklow would lie bleeding. But then Francis would have to kind of like, give him mouth to mouth or bandage his head and <laughs> make sure he's I don't, all right i don't know i think it's enough for martin mucklow that fr that francis exists fiery francis exists and walks around this morning and you can tell probably martin mucklow bitches him up in the pub and he's always like yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. But he bitches him up 
and sort of Francis comes around shaking his charity tin and Martin will probably say something really derogatory about the charity, you know, all begins at home, look after your own or some such bullshit. And Francis mm. will just smile and go in his way. And it would, that would rile Martin. The fact that Francis exists and the fact that he, he knows that Francis is a better man than him. Mm. And I think that, I, I, that's, yeah, I think that's the justice. You don't mm. ever see them. You're right. You don't ever see yeah. them. But I just think, I just think in a way that Martin wouldn't ever want to step into that sphere because no. somehow, even though he's a vicar and he's more diminutive and he's got this silly little beard and he's got his nice jumper and all of his good deeds, that Martin can't stand up to him as a man. Mm. Mm. I think Sandra. I think Sandra in the aftermath mentions that Martin because it says something about well, Martin called him a bald-headed nonce and he's not he's not a nonce at all. You know, it's sort of like one of those things like Martin does about having a like, saying that this person's yeah. like this. And so I think that's the only time I've heard that well, Martin that's really mentioned interesting the because you can you can imagine that Martin would be saying the absolute worst thing that you can possibly say about someone. It always amazes me on Twitter when you see people sort of using the word nonce, you go, You think we're saying ponce. And don't really know what you're saying but for martin to use that that and especially in a really small community that that is really actually a, a shocking shocking thing to say about mm. somebody and instead what comes back is people go well he's not that at all exactly. and you can feel martin's influence kind of crumbling and flaking away and again it's done so deftly so deftly with such a sort of a light but potent touch and um yeah i'm i'm always kind of blown away in admiration for the deftness of the writing the sheer i know how it just doesn't make heavy weather and it does it so lightly but it makes it it's like being rabbit punched in the kidneys you know you don't see it coming you don't even really, you, you know, you just think well, that's going to be nothing. And then you're in hospital on a, on a drip. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> how I characterise the writing in this country. You don't see it coming and then you're on a drip. That should be the quote on the DVD yeah, box. <laughs> yeah. Your family are gathered around you looking sad and you're not allowed to eat anything. That's, that's <laughs> and there's yeah. sort of blood in your urine. <laughs> But after I, I, I think it, I've taken that as far as you can go. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, after I'd watched the, the three series, I always got to the conclusion that Martin avoided the vicar. No, I agree with you. I think, but that's what I mean about, yeah. I don't think Martin, Martin would, Martin would feel really safe mm. in the pub going, oh, he's a fucking wanker. But if he had mm. to stand in the cold light yeah. of day, in the burning sun at a cricket match, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he'd shrivel. Because yeah. he knows that Francis is a better man than him. Yeah. That yeah. Francis, you know, with his hand knitted sweater and his little dog collar and all his kind of, um, you know, liturgical chants and all the rest of it. He and Martin, Martin's got nothing. He's got yeah. nothing to offer. He's got empty hands, and um, and an empty heart. And he knows that deep down. He absolutely knows that. Mm. and it's a it's his it's his great source of shame and maybe that's what makes him kind of no it doesn't make him do anything the only thing martin cares about is martin mm. and i think that's what comes across really really strongly at the end is that everybody sees not thinks not that kerry's been stupid it's that martin's been an arsehole because kerry is lost and she mm. wants to be loved Oh God, it's, I mean, it's incredibly moving. Yeah. And I was watching it and going like, but there's, there's got to be more, there's got to be more. I need to know what happens next. I need to mm. know what happens next. But of course they give it the perfect ending. I'm desperate to, I'm desperate to know what they're going to do next. I mean, I know that I've been following Daisy May Cooper's Instagram throughout um, lockdown and it is genuinely one of the funniest, funniest things. Have you been following? Oh, her? absolutely. Absolutely. She just doesn't care, does she? And that's the thing. It's watching it. her navigate her pregnancy and her daughter during lockdown has been, and and also watching, but just sort of like there was this whole thing which came off a, um, an Instagram post of one of those kind of like incredible looking 
uh, women sort of like what can you fit under your boob and it was like <laughs> nothing <laughs> anyway and she had this thing where she put a broom under her boob and started dancing with it and she just got a slew of women responding like what can you somebody had a fucking hoover under there <laughs> somebody else had an oil painting <laughs> i saw an ironing board i just on think <laughs> i just think that that also it just opened the door for people to go i'm stuck in the house my kid's gone feral. I've gone feral. I'm having a baby. I don't know what's wrapping in with my fucking body right now. It's that's gone feral. Let's be feral together and just be fucking nice to each other. Yeah. Now, I, I'm going to start off by laughing at myself. You can have that one for free. And I just sort of, it was kind of amazing and really sort of like generous and hilarious. And also the conversations with her daughter are a thing of beauty, an mm. absolute thing of beauty. So I don't, so Charlie doesn't seem to do any social media, but Daisy, Daisy May Cooper's um, Instagram over lockdown has been an absolute joy. And also she's just brought joy to people just by going, oh, fucking look at this, look, look, oh, really? You're, you're posing in a bikini, we're in a pandemic. Fuck it, give me that broom, I'm going to stick it under my tit. <laughs> and it, <laughs> There's something so gloriously kind of subversive about it, which is we all feel like shit. We're all at home. Everything's gone absolutely apeshit. Yeah. Here's me holding a holding a kind of washing up, but you know, a sort of laundry basket under my boobs. What can you put under yours? And it, I love it because it just went, oh, sod it. Let's let's just do this instead. And it yeah. felt really generous and inclusive and hilarious and just people giggling and having fun together so i'm i cannot wait to see what these guys do next i i um i really can't mm. do you have uh, any idea well they, i know they, daisy may just had a baby obviously so yeah. they have been writing something they've been writing a new thing so uh, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> a new thing. apparently they finished the first draft now. oh yeah, so that that's going to be interesting. Oh. <laughs> any hint? Well, any hint of the? No area? idea. No idea. No. Sure. They won't no. know. At all. No. Oh shit, guys! I uh. thought you'd have an in. Well, oh, well I mean, Neil, 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 Neil does uh, does see them quite rarely, uh, quite often. Well, a lot of, a lot more than me, and uh, I think he has been trying to get little. I've been chipping away little, little chipping away. bits to try and get little bits of information, away, but, but yeah, uh, they don't. They're not. They know that we probably say on here, and they don't want to spill. No, but all, no. And, and also, yeah. when you're bringing a new, when you're working on something new, it feels so. It, it it is so weird and naked and vulnerable and odd. You don't want to tell anybody about mm. it in case you fuck it up. And yeah, yeah. You, yeah. In your head, you're going, this is going to be amazing. And then when you have to, you know, you pitch an idea and then you go, you have to go home and go, oh, fuck, I've got to do it now. Oh, mm. And um, so I don't blame them. Keep it under their hats. Yeah. Keep it under their hats and protect, protect what's brilliant about the pair of them. So when it comes to your writing then, Sarah, um, what's your process when you've got a blank sheet of paper or a blank screen in front of you? Crying. Yeah, <laughs> and, lo and loads of gin. <laughs> no, I try not to drink when I'm writing because then I just write. Oh, hang on, my dog wants attention. Oh. Um, I think it's an interesting thing because I spent so long in EastEnders, and sometimes, um, you know, you're writing scripts, so you write scripts ever so fast sometimes, and overnight sometimes, which is real sort of seat of the pants stuff, and um. I tend to have an image in my mind of why I wanted to write the thing in the first place. And that's the thing I'm chasing. So I start at the beginning and then I sit there until I've done it. That is literally my process. And I, um, my family falls out of me, my friends fall out of me, I don't eat properly, I drink too much. I used to smoke, I don't smoke anymore, but my God, I used to absolutely chain the cigarettes and um and but I sit there till it's done. I mm. start with scene one, and because by the time I sit down, I don't make notes and I don't kind of do a map or anything like that. Everything's in here, and then I kind of, and then I kind of fight with it until it's there. Right. And that might be 
like a week later or 10 days later or I'm going back and I, I edit a lot as I write because sometimes things occur to me and I go oh well sh whoa, 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 shit that's not right that's that's going to take us spiraling off into an area where we don't want to go because it takes us away from the story mm. so I tend to edit um, a first draft as I write because I really well by the time I've delivered a first draft I really want to feel like I've um, that the world is mine and that people really go right this is absolutely that there isn't too many um, anomalies where you go but this doesn't make sense this world doesn't make sense so you feel like you've got to really there's always work to do always 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 loads and loads and loads of work to do and changes to do and production notes but from the first thing i like to kind of be entirely uh almost dangerously immersed in it and not come up for air until i feel like i've sort of sprayed my musk on it right. <laughs> So when you're writing something like EastEnders, how hard is it to keep the continuity? Oh, the continuity. I mean, like, um, on Enders, you know, you generally write week to week. And sometimes the continuity was a constant sort of like a constantly evolving thing. Mm. Like you might have a really late stage script three weeks before yours, which had a massive change for reasons. And then that would knock on down to yours. So it's, you're always on the bounce. You're always mm. on the bounce. But I think that starting in that kind of world kind of sets you up to be able to deal with what production can throw at you which is um yeah we're a week into this we're a week into production we're 17 pages over schedule we need to lose this this and this but they're really important important parts of the story so can we put and so it's all the, you know by the time you've delivered your scripts and that they are now into production drafts and shooting scripts the next stage of your job is to be able to provide answers to all the things which about what about the money what about the weather what about this thing fell up fell down over here oh shit we're in a pandemic it, you know it's to to quite um to write inventive solutions and to know your world and your scripts well enough to be able to fuck around with them to provide solutions for production and budget and all those other things Mm. so just learning that you know like that's that things change you know you get a call at five you know seven o'clock in the morning go you know that script you thought was finished oh yeah 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 well it isn't oh okay fine right. and but that's just that's just that world and it's such a sh it's so adrenalized it's quite addictive and it's um you know i loved it yeah. so when, when you have been doing it for a while like that and you've sort of got it down and you know what you're doing, D can you sort of then write anyway? Because if you can do that, you can sort of write anything in any situation. Is it a good training for that? Well, what you mean, EastEnders, for example? Yeah, I mean, if, you, I mean, if you're working... I think, I think the thing is, is that, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, beyond the fact that I, I love soap anyway, and, and you know, it, everyone was a bit snobby about it. Sometimes people call it long-running series. I go, no, no, fucking don't call it that. It's a <laughs> soap opera. I don't... <laughs> Don't don't take its you know its sort of uniqueness away from it, just because it makes it you know I celebrate that. But yeah. I think that one of the things, but because you you've got to really the, the the interesting thing about soap is that it's generally you know there it is everybody knows it they kind of know you know they come in they're exhausted they've had a really shit day at work train was whatever it, you don't know what mood somebody is in mm. when they turn on the show that you've written that episode for and they've got to do this they've got to get his dinner on fuck knows what's going on and so it can either be background noise but your job is to write it in such a way so that someone's going to do this and do that and hang on a minute what the fuck did they just say <laughs> and for that half an hour yeah. for that half an hour nothing else matters but the story you're telling them because mm. it matters yeah and if you're not you know that's what i've always sort of believed because that's how i love to watch like soap where you're kind of absolutely leaning forward you're on the edge of your seat with your hand like that and even if you're just watching a kind of a, a, a you know an episode that's a kind of filler where you know you're building up to something but you're not quite there you've got to add all of that so people go oh fuck, what's going to happen and I'm the audience, so I'm writing for me. I'm writing for how I want to watch. Mm. So 
I really hate it when you when people are kind of like oh, it's only a fucking soap opera. It, yeah, no, no, it's everything. Mm. So when I was sort of moving and and started to do like other sorts of work, it was those were the same principles that I took on. And sometimes when I've been interviewed about stuff or being asked questions about stuff, and people go like, oh wow, you started on soap and now you're doing this. But don't treat it like they're two separate things. Don't treat it as though somehow I broke free of that particular genre and now i'm elevated to another no fuck off don't do that they are the same thing you're telling stories and you're telling stories to for an audience who have given you their time so fucking make it worthwhile for them yeah. don't treat them like twats and and invest you know and it's um I, i'm always like the big believer of you know that everyone goes oh you know oh here's this character and it they just walk across a square no 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 when you think about those shows you think about those great peroxided matriarchs and you know all you need for an episode really is two of them in a room and a bottle of gin and a packet of fags and if you can't write that shit you can't write mm. because essentially you know what you're doing is like it's Eleanor of Aquitaine and Margaret D'Anjou wading thigh high through the blood of their enemies but they've got acrylic nails <laughs> you know it's a big fight in the pub no it's not it's the oristea but they've got hair extensions mm -hmm. so you always take that huge kind of thematic thing and really invest it and and don't treat it cheaply because the people you're watching who are in watching it with you you know watching what you've written they're giving you their time they're giving you their love and dedication to follow this show so mm -hmm. give them a fucking show mm -hmm. right give yeah, them a yeah. fucking show so Sarah, I've got to ask then, with your time on EastEnders, what was your favourite end of the uh, episode dump dump moment that you ever did? Well, there's several actually. Um, oh, there's loads of them. I never wrote one which I thought was a, was naff, or tried not to anyway. And I think for the sheer audacity of it, it had to be Hello Princess when I brought Den back from the dead just because what the fuck. Mm -hmm. And then I I really enjoyed killing him with Pauline Fowler's dog shaped doorstop. And then <laughs> I really enjoyed digging him up again. <laughs> but sometimes, weirdly, it was the quieter moments that would really, really got me in the feels, which was um it's a second episode I wrote, and it was I don't know. Dot think uh, it was just a, a Dot and Jim scene, and she fought, and she and and she bent the episode thinking, oh, I, I'm such a fucking weird woman. How can somebody ever love me? And it was just Dot and Jim under a, um, a cherry tree in the allotments, and she's like, I'm, how can you, how can you stay with me? How can you love me? I'm not like anyone else. And he says, but I know that. I knew that when I set my cap at you, didn't I? And then they just held hands under a cherry tree, and it was really, really sweet. And I wrote um, a series of episodes where Stacey Slater, who'd been this little baggage, and you suddenly realised why she was this, who she was, because she went home and looked after her mum, who was bipolar, and you realised that this really aggressive, annoying, bitchy young woman, she'd been a child carer all her life, and all she'd known was loss and trauma and trying to manage her mum's condition. And it was really, really brutal and sad that we got to the end and it. But there was just a bit at the end where, you know, she was waiting outside the Slater's house and Mo, who sort of fetched her home after this really traumatic week, just said, come in, Stacey, come in where it's warm. And it was just, you know, it's warm. Because the thing is with those shows, like Corrie, mm. Enders, Emmerdale, whatever, it's not actually the great big duff duff moments. I mean, they're the ones that people talk about. You ain't my mother. Yes, I am. Merry Christmas. And whatever. They, they, they are really, really important. But actually, the ones that really kind of get into people's souls are the little quiet ones. I wrote, I wrote uh, um, an Armistice Day one where Alfie took Nana Moon to France to see the grave of her, um, her young husband who, who'd uh, died and... He, um, Alfie hadn't been able to accept that his Nana was dying and during that episode he had to accept it and it was very sweet and very sad and it went out with this lovely little bit of wartime music and then I wrote, the last episode I wrote for the Tenders was Peggy's final, Peggy's final episode and where I brought Pat back, Pat came back as a kind of ghost 
which, uh, you know, sounded bonkers, but sort of worked. Mm. I mean, like, if you were dying and knew that you'd accepted that and you think, who would you want to see? You wouldn't want to see any of your husbands, any of your lovers, not even your kids. The person you'd want is, a per is a, the, the face you'd want to see is a face you'd slapped a thousand times. <laughs> and who, the yeah. face you knew better than you knew your own. And I thought, well, let's have Pat coming back all lit up like a Woolworths Christmas tree to see Peggy across the water. That, that's mm. the way I want to do it. And it, it's, it always seems to me that actually it's a tiny bombs. That's what makes soap special. It's not the kind of, I don't know, the tram fall or the helicopter falling out of the sky. You know, that's just fucking nonsense, really, to be honest with you. Mm. The stuff that is really, really makes soap is the normal everyday stuff. And then it's a tiny bombs that happen between people in a room. That's what it is. That's it's it's the um, the heart's blood. That's what that's that's where the power is of soap. Mm. So when you were writing those final final moments, like the Hello Princess, you didn't type Hello Princess, press enter, and then go do, 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 to yourself. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of hear it in your head, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, well, the thing is, I mean, I've grown up watching this show, and me and my mum used to love it. And after episodes of EastEnders, we'd ring each other up and talk about Grant and what was he playing at with Tiffany's mum. And but my dad when my dad was alive, he absolutely fucking loathed it. So when I got on the show and I had my first episode going out and it was just like, oh my God. So you watch it and you're like, oh Jesus Christ. And it goes, doo, 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 <laughs> written by Sarah Phelps. And straight away my phone rang, because of course it's your mum. Mm. And your mum is honour bound, duty bound and contractually obliged ever since you bring home a bit of sugar paper with some macaroni and glitter stuff in it with your mummy, she went, oh, that's lovely, well done, you're brilliant. She rang up and she went like, well done, it was amazing, oh, because of course that's what your mum does. I said, oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I said, did dad like it? And I could hear my dad shouting from the front room, I liked it when it was over. <laughs> like, oh, thanks a lot. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was just a sat there kind of suffering. Just like, uh, why have I got to watch his absolute dreck? Absolute fucking uh, dreck. Just to see your name at the end of this. This isn't fair. <laughs> did he have to do that for it, like all 94 episodes that you did? <laughs> I, excuse me, 100 episodes. Actually. Oh, well, then IMDb is wrong then. It says 94 on there, so you need to get that no, changed. 100. I, I, for my telegram from the Queen, I got to kill Peggy. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think I think that once he, he felt he'd done his duty after one, and then he just right. got my mum to tell him about it. Mm. Oh, bless and then he, him. I'd say, if you enjoyed if you enjoyed my week on EastEnders, Dad, he'd be like, yeah. oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well done. Uh, right, <laughs> we're going to play me back when you do something worth you know. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to play a little game. We're going to play Kerry or Curtain. Okay. Oh I'm, God, I'm, I hope I can do this. I'm going to give you a line of dialogue. You need to tell me if it was Kerry or Curtain that said it. Okay. We've got five of these. Uh, oh Lord, I feel pressure. Uh, there's no pressure at all. Okay. Here's number one. Well, what I'm going to do is knock on the door and leave it for five seconds, and if she doesn't come, at least I've tried. Oh, that's got to be Curtain. That was Kerry. That, oh, no! <laughs> that was Kerry going for tea talk with Florence the very first time. Oh, no. In the, in the Vicar's Son. Okay, number two. Who doesn't say morning? When someone says morning, who doesn't say it back? That sounds like a bit kind of like they'd write to points of view. So that makes me think it's curtain. That is curtain. Well done. Oh. That's the steam fair episode when the uh, the red. Because he's quite moany, curtain. He's quite moany. Yeah. He'd be quite. If he was given any power in, uh, over the village Facebook page, you know he'd be stirring yeah. some shit. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's when the uh, uh, red headed, red hooded twat, little red riding twat, walks past oh, him in the field. No, yeah. And he doesn't say he uh, good morning he back to him. Grudge, Curtin, you he know certainly it. does. Yes. Number three. Uh, do you know what this is utter slander? That's Curtin. That's Kerry. Oh, fuck off! That is. <laughs> That's Kerry oh, when, when Sue is slagging off Martin in Peeping Tom. 
there you go. It was so, the use of the words utter slander, and I thought yes. that is curtain. That is yeah. something that if somebody put something on a message board about how he kept his lager taps or whatever when he's working at the club, then he'd really go for it. Damn. I, yeah. He, whenever Curtin uses that word slander, utter, he always points with his middle finger, if you notice. If he says utter, he points with his middle finger. I don't know why it's the middle finger, but there we go. Uh, I think no, that's telling. I okay. think it is I'm, telling. I, you, this is really doing my head in now. I've got okay, that wrong. that's really one out of three. Myself. Here's number four. Did you cry because you missed us so much? Well, that is definitely, I'm absolutely certain that is to Vicar Francis. That is a line to Vicar Francis. That is I'm correct, it is. I'm tempted to say it's Kerry, but I feel like by this point, Kerry and Curtin are in a kind of competition for Vicar Francis's affections. So I think that is, I think that's a Curtin. You talked yourself out of that one. That was Kerry. Oh, <laughs> oh. I hate you. I wouldn't have ever met you. <laughs> that, was, that was the station episode in series three when the vicar was coming. But yes. I feel like it was... God damn it. I'm <laughs> this. That's one out of four. So here's oh, the last one. Yeah, all right. Just, I wish I'd never told you about the twirl in the floppy coffee. <laughs> you don't deserve to know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just asking the questions. Here you go. Number five. Push forward, rip out their insides, take them out, and walk away. <laughs> Push forward, rip out their insides, take them out, and walk away. I can't even. I, I can't even identify the context of that one. I feel, but I feel like. I'm, because I've been wrong so many times and said Curtin when it's been Kerry, I'm going to have to stick with Curtin. This feels like he's trying to be macho. I don't know what he's talking about. He could be talking about anything. He could be talking about a bag of frazzles, but I'm going to go with Curtin. Look, one out of five isn't bad, is it? I mean, you know, it was you Kerry. Know, what the fuck are you? You're a pair of bastards. I it was Kerry. I'm going to write it on every bus shelter I find. <laughs> in the <laughs> aftermath, in the special episode when he, she's talking to her half brothers, right at the end, right at the end, one out of five, Sarah. That's not bad. Oh, no, it's that's not so zero. Bad. It's, we've like had a... zero before, so don't worry. You're not bottom of the table. You know, when we have you on again... I'm really close to it. Oh, <laughs> shame. I feel dirty and tainted. Well, go and get a twirl and have a hot, frothy coffee in your field. Oh, yeah, fly. I wish I'd never told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, what are you... Is there anything you can tell us about what you're working on at the moment? Have you got any um, projects that you're excited about? Um, yes, but... Um, they're, one of them, I think, is very funny, uh, but heartbreaking. And um, I don't want to say too much because we're still putting it together. And I hopefully, you know, all be, everything being COVID dependent, we might get to film it next year. We might not. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but it's about a, a very scandalous divorce in the 1960s. And um, we feature it. And it's lots of rudeness and obscenity which is nice nice and um the other thing i'm working on which was announced by the it's been announced i can talk about it it's about a real life uh, a real life murder investigation which took place again in a very sweet safe small village and it's a true story and there's a lot of responsibility to it there's precious little laughs but it's a really important story and you know you're working with you know relatives of people who went through a, an appalling situation but it's about gaslighting and manipulation and quite staggering malevolence so that's one of the ones where i think i need to, you know i'm going to need to have some comedy just to when i finish working on it i'm going to need something to go give me some lightness and so I sort of spin and what the other besides watching this country the other thing I've had a lot on my um is uh, the 
is uh, from the Oast House, you know, the, oh, the, the, the Alan Partridge, Partridge podcast. Yeah. And just because another sustained sort of feat of absolute comic brilliance. And so I can feel myself while I'm writing about these terrible things that happen in a small place. I'm going to need to slightly less terrible things happening in a small place. So I feel like this country and from the Oast House might provide that balance for me. Mm. Mm. So uh, one more thing, because we've uh, we got the impending uh, US version of this country uh, yeah. coming up. What 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 are your feels on that? Well, my feels on that are I'm kind of delighted for Ta Daisy May and, and Charlie. I'm wondering what their input is, like what their creative input is. But if um, this country, I mean, I'm, I, I have no idea where they would set it. Uh, do you, I mean, I'm imagining a kind of like... Kansas, obvious, I believe. Obviously, like rural, rural Kansas, because... Uh, uh, yeah. Did you ever watch a, sh a movie called, I think it was just called American Movie, and it was about kind of metalheads in sort of Wyoming. You ever seen that film? That rings a bell. And it was just one of those films where you go, Christ almighty, living in a rural America is... An astonishing experience because like we moan that we've got to get a bus for four hours to get to a town. They've got to drive for like literally like four hours, four days to reach anywhere. But it's a, it's a really interesting movie. I'd be really if it if it does for rural that that kind of sensibility, which is watching it and actually being loving the comedy, but actually being totally caught up in those characters' lives, then that will be a brilliant thing, I think. Mm. And I feel really proud of homegrown talent in this country absolutely slaying it in America. Absolutely yeah. slaying it. Mm. It makes me feel really proud and happy that incredible original work is irresistible to that audit to to people making TV in America. I, it's it's just like catnip and they go right well we want some of that we want this really badly it's kind of touched something in us on oh, i'm over the moon for um daisy may and charlie that that kind of originality and unique creativity with writing and performances recognized mm. yeah Wonderful. and i hope it's a massive success oh so, yeah. yeah we do as well because it means we can carry on doing the podcast yeah, I know, I know, but genuinely i really do hope <laughs> it's a massive success because apart from anything else i think that everything that comedy has an in, and has a, and especially comedy like that has an incredible role to play hmm. which is you're watching lives that you might never imagine and mm. I think that with America, I mean, America, oh Christ almighty, I don't even know why anybody would want to be, the, be in charge of, of that mess right now. It's genuinely really frightening. And I think maybe a sort of a show about heartbreak and trying to be loved and make it through your life in the, mm -hmm. you know, in a rural backwater in America. I don't know. It might do something really important. Mm. It might do something really, really important. Yeah, you know. let's hope so. Yeah, it is hoping, yeah. Um, Sarah, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Well, thank you so much for asking me. I've, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I've enjoyed my gin and tonic. Yeah, uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, we never got to speak to her about loads of other things, so hopefully you'll, you'll come back and we can, we can chat some more. Two. I'd love to. That was great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed myself. Wonderful. That's what we yeah. like to hear. Yeah. Neil, do you want to do your little bits and pieces? Yes, of course. Um, you can find us on all the social media sites under This Country Pod. You can email us with any questions or anything you'd like to ask us at wtafthiscountry at hotmail.com. And likewise, we have a website which has everything there to your touch, including tickets to our last live show on the 28th of May 2021, fingers crossed, at wtafpodcast.com. Wonderful. And you can come and become a Patreon peeper if you want to come and support the podcast. Just go to patreon.com forward slash WTAF. Wonderful. Thank you again, Sarah. It's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely chatting to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Take care. Thank you, very much, Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, that was awesome. Wonderful. Oh. And thank you very much, everybody. Go and get plumbed, you fuckers. Scarecrow Festival is like the most important day of the year. <laughs> Daft cow. This is just ridiculous. What the actual fuck? Mm.
How is that crass? How is that crass?